This is Susan's first, inter first sit-down interview that she's doing since she became the new president of, of CBS News. And Susan, thank you very much for that. But very seriously, Susan Zarinsky is a badass. Do you consider yourself a badass? Absolutely not. No, no. I, I, I have always thought of myself as a working girl. Mm -hmm. That is just who I am. And there's nothing I won't do in any situation. And that has been my philosophy since I started as a desk assistant uh, in the Washington Bureau two weeks after the Watergate break-in to now. And I just, I've always thought of myself as one of the, one of the guys. I hate to say that, but like I was like neutral. It was whatever needed to be done, I wanted to do it. So you have been, you have passed up before, I believe it was 2011. Um, uh, uh oh, incoming. <laughs> a, an office job, so to speak, a job to be in charge. And you, in accepting this president of CBS News job, you decided you want to retain the senior executive producer title. So your title is senior executive producer and president of CBS News. What does that mean? You know, because, of, because my entire career has looked at the world through the prism of a producer, which gives you a, a base. It, it is um, aggregating information. It is being collegial. It is talking to people. It's observing. It's being struck by people you interview. It's being struck by the world around you. I, that's how I see myself as a producer. And I thought in a management job of CBS News, which is about producing broadcasts, that I need to maintain that core value of who I am. And also, if it doesn't work out, I can go back to producing. <laughs> and I don't have to get a new business card. I could just like cross it out or white it out. Um, but seriously, I think of myself as a producer. And the prism that I look at, that's, what I, that's my core value. So this is a big and important job of changing things, I believe, at CBS News, at a time when CBS has been through sort of a lot of, a, lot, a fair amount of trauma through the Me Too uh, maelstrom and... You mean, um, uh, you mean the year of living dangerously? The year of living dangerously, yes. I just want to get that. So this is a, this is a big step up, Susan. What do you want to change? Look, I think that the most interesting thing at CBS is that the people that work there have this core value of it's, it's, a, it's a calling. We really have, we hold dear the CBS reputation of being journalists of content, of, of being the standard bearers. And because of a confluence of events that have occurred, we still are that group of great journalists. So what I want to really accomplish is taking the, the core of journalism, taking the stories, taking the content, telling how, taking how we tell stories, and I want to raise that up to the level of most important. Look, I think that people, we've all gone through the Me Too movement in whatever business we've been in, and sometimes when you ha something happens, even wars, it's over. You move on, you've learned something. This will never be over. This now is a point in our culture and in our society that no person can come out of the last year and some and treat people the same way. There is a, an increased sense of sensibility and an increased volume of information that puts everything on a different playing field. The tectonic plates have shifted, but they're never going to lock again. They're always going to have some movement. And I think that for me, culturally at CBS, it really is about empowering people, empowering listening. And when we hear something, we react. I think that is the most important thing. So give an example of that. When we hear something, we react. What, you know, a lot of the criticism has been things were talked about, but nothing happened. Mm -hmm. That's different. That is different. We're listeners now. We have put into place 
listening. There's a colleague of mine, Lori Rosenfeld, who's out in the audience. Chief who's People Officer. Chief, RP, Chief People Officer, who has really worked just tirelessly at, at giving us extra people and setting out an agenda that makes us listeners. Because to do a great job, you have to feel okay about the workplace. And that's, the, that's a, just a giant cultural change that there are open doors for people to go and talk and consult. And I, I, I feel a different energy at CBS. I feel a different sensibility. And it's exciting. And what about on the journalistic front? How do you, is CBS owning the big stories in the way that you would like to see, be, see CBS owning the stories? Um, C. Gail King, Twitter, uh, just, uh, just put in Gail King and the, the answer to that question. <laughs> Um, Explain that for people who no, know, who I mean, saw R. Kelly and Gail. Here's, here's and the thing. I mean, I, I, there was a very funny Colbert line, actually, after Gail had interviewed R. Kelly. And it's now like, no matter what happens, if you're mad or something's explosive, all you have to do is say, Robert, <laughs> Robert. <laughs> very quiet and still, Robert. I tried it on my husband the other night, and he looked at me and goes, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> like, I said, so then I said, Joe. <laughs> Joe. Um, the, you know, here's the interesting thing. We have had some unbelievable, really substantial gets. Um, Diana Miller, who has been overseeing CBS This Morning, I mean, listen, Gail interviewed Governor Northam on the blackface controversy. Um, you know, Beto O'Rourke wanted to announce to Gail. Um, John Dickerson had Bernie Sanders. Uh, Gail just interviewed some of the accusers of uh, Lieutenant Governor Fairfax. Uh, 60 you did minutes. a lot on the Michael Jackson accusers. We, uh, yes, and, and before the HBO documentary even aired. Um, Scott Pelley did an unbelievable interview with acting FBI Director McCabe that was stunning. So here's the thing. I, I, I am like the luckiest person in the planet because the journalism is there. We don't have to hire the people to break the stories. I got that covered. We have that covered. What I'm gonna do is create an environment where it, it is, we wanna take no prisoners, Tr seriously. Different networks have, di and I'm sorry if there are any other networks here. Different networks have different takes on how to approach things. We're hard news, but we're hard news with a heart. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't exclude the stories about heroes. But we are first and foremost, I want to reclaim the baton that still exists of the legacy of CBS. I mean that. You know, over the next two years. And what is that? Over the next two years, I feel is the most important two years that we're going to look at as the election approaches. And our job is to reveal America to itself. There is nothing more important. And the legacy of CBS is something that all of us hold really close. And, you know, I, I think that that's the, solid, that's the solid piece that never varies. And, you know, I sh I'm not going to curse. I promise, Krista, I'm not going to curse. <laughs> but shit happens. <laughs> it does. And you have to roll with it. And you have to accommodate it. And you just have to say, what's the main, what am I doing? What's the main purpose? Charlie Daggett, who is a reporter out of London, was in ISIS land. And we kept thinking, okay, ISIS is going to fall, ISIS is going to fall. He'd been there for three weeks. The poor guy hadn't had a shower in three weeks. And there were women with him. And I, I saw them washing her hair with a, with a bottle of water and, you know, trying to help her out. Um, and all of a sudden, we start to come out. He says, I can't come out. I think it's going to happen next week. He went back in, and we were one of the few reporters there as ISIS fell. This is the CBS that I'm representing. I mean, I could make, I could cry. I could cry and a lot. And that's the but, CBS but, that the C, that that is the CBS that you may. I mean, you were a big part of making CBS known for that. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause on that. I want to go do. I do want to go back to your earlier career, but I want to ask you a very sort of pointed question here. So you have a situation now with <clears throat> ratings that 
should be improved in the evening news and a situation where CBS this morning, which I watch every single morning uh, since Charlie Rose left, uh, the ratings have not been great. And you have Gail and Nora and Incoming. John Dickerson and a woman in that trio who would love to move to Washington and be anchoring the evening news. How are you thinking about that, Susan? Put your phones down, no news. <laughs> I'm thinking about everything a lot. I, I can wake up, I wake up sometimes. I'm not a sleeper. I'm just not a sleeper. I, I'm a four hour a night at most. But I've been waking up every night at like three in the morning thinking about all of these things. Mm -hmm. And I'm not like one of those people that like hugs your husband in the middle of the night, but I found myself hugging Joe. And, and, <laughs> Joe turns around like in a recent hug and he says, do you have cancer or something? <laughs> I, like, um, I said, no, I'm just thinking about the evening news. Um, here's the interesting thing. Here's a non-answer to that question. Um, the great thing about every single person at CBS and in the anchor positions are they're great, they are great at their jobs. They may not, I may want to shift people, not everybody may be in the right places, but they are outstanding in their jobs, in their caring, in the commitment to CBS. And so, keep your phones down, no news. Um, the reality is, things have to play out. And I am a person that believes that the right things will happen. Uh, granted, you, sometimes you have to push a bit, Sometimes you have to absorb uh, circumstances, but there isn't a single person that's on the air that isn't a committed journalist that cares deeply about what they do. Mm -hmm. Krista, how's that for a non-answer answer, really? <laughs> I, think I, got that, I think I got that down pretty well. Ah, excellent, excellent. So Susan, what, so I just want to acknowledge that Susan was the CBS bureau chief when Tiananmen Square happened, uh, the student uprising and the military response, when uh, the first Persian Gulf War, when uh, CBS was, was it, Susan was in charge and CBS was the first news crew in Kuwait immediately following the Allied forces. Um, Susan started her career, as she said, with Watergate literally beginning. And I would like to know, Susan, what in that very interesting history, and I left so much out, I mean, just take it from there, what was the most meaningful formative experience? Whoa. Um, you know, I had, I had gone to college and I went to American University thinking I was going to be a Hollywood film director. I, I really, I loved editing, I loved storytelling, I, I just was fascinated with film. And I got a part-time job, literally, a desk assistance, a desk assistance job uh, on Saturday nights only, not even Sundays, just Saturdays. And I walked into the Washington Bureau and the world was exploding. Um, and it was exploding in a way that journalism was holding a White House accountable for incredible acts. And I found myself on Saturday nights as the lowest person on the totem pole, traveling with a camera crew to every garage in a, in a 50 mile radius of Washington, Maryland, Virginia, because our assignment editor believed that I could find Deep Throat, that that was the night that they were dumping the info on Woodward and Bernstein. My camera crew was wildly amused. They loved the overtime. Um, and I felt like I was looking for history. And, and you were in college. I was in college. And living in a dorm. Yes, I was in college. And so I would have these amazing nights. I would stake out the Attorney General, John Mitchell, outside the Jefferson Hotel. These were really exciting times. And then I go back to the dorm, and everybody was puking from having their nights out. And I, all I wanted to do was tell them about like I got to see, I got to see Attorney General Mitchell, and we got a picture of him leaving with these Cuban guys, and we think, and they're going, "Are you nuts? Are you crazy?" And it was in that period of time, especially when Nixon resigned, that I said, I called my father and I said, "I know what I want to do," 
I want to be in journalism. I want to feel the impact, even as a desk assistant, that I felt I was in the newsroom alone uh, and the wire machines, those of you who are of a certain age, they were wire machines and they were in these cabinets and when something big, they would go ding, 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 ding. And I walked over and the wire machine said, President Nixon has fired Elliot Richardson and this was the Saturday Night Massacre. And I was alone in the bureau because, because the desk assignment editor had gone up the street to get food, pre-cell phone. Phone rings, it's the bureau chief who doesn't even know who I am. And I, uh, he says, is there some story about Nixon fire? I said, yes, sir. I said, who is this? And he said, who the hell is this? And I said, well, I'm, I'm the Saturday desk assistant, sir. Who is this? And he said, it's Abba Eben. You know, it's like the president of Egypt. And I said, I don't think it's Abba Eben, but let me just be responsive. And he said, Dan Rather's coming off the eight o'clock shuttle. Go get him, and where the hell is, he, he used a different word, where the F is Sid Fetters, and I said, getting food at the Aster. <laughs> so, Sid Fetters goes, I send the courier with a helmet to pick Dan up, and I thought to myself, I have found my calling. <laughs> and, um, and to this day, Bill Small is just a treasure of a human being. He was the... He was the bureau chief. He was the bureau chief. It wasn't so, Abba Eben calling me from Egypt. I went, over to, uh, <laughs> I went over to Susan's office yesterday because I knew that she had quite a bit of memorabilia there. And I actually came over to see her office more than to see you. But Susan ended up giving me a tour. I mean, she has Dan, she has Dan Rather's like first typewriter and all this stuff. The manual typewriter from Ma the White House. Yeah, crazy stuff. So I... So we, we plotted this and we talked Very about cool. bringing something that was a good sort of memento of her earlier days. Memento coming. Yes. So Susan, explain what you're going to pull out. So I am uh, pulling out and it's actually funny because it's an envelope and it says the White House and the name on it that scratched out was Jerry Warren, who was the White House press secretary at that point. I have no idea how I acquired this envelope or, what, or why my name Under was Nixon. on it. Under Nixon. But I did use it as a storage. Now, the night, the night Nixon resigned, um, I, as the production clerk at that point, um, I was working with Walter and Cronkite. Cronkite and um, it was a very emotional day, obviously, in Washington. And uh, Cronkite dumped his script into the trash. And I said, uh, Walter, don't you want to keep it for history? He goes, oh, no, no, they do transcripts. I'll get one in New York. So um, I've now become famous for trash dumping, for trash diving. But so this is Cronkite's top copy from the night Nixon resigned. And the writer was Charlie West, a phenomenal writer. But these scratchings are Walters. And I'll just read, I'll read like just the beginning and the end. And I, this is my most prized possession. Anybody know who Frank Luntz is? He's a pollster. Frank Luntz knows I have this. He, every time I see that man, he begs me to keep it on loan because if you think I'm crazy, Frank has an Oval Office replica in his house. And I said, if I give this to you on loan, I know I'm never gonna get it back. <laughs> so no. So um, this was uh, Cronkite's copy. Good evening. The 37th president of the United States resigned today. The 38th took office. It was an orderly succession but with each occurrence and historic event, unparalleled in the two centuries the nation has existed. In departing, Richard Nixon spoke with intense emotion, and in arriving, so did Gerald Ford. And I'm just gonna skip to the end, because it's... And so, virtually on the eve of her bicentennial, the United States has passed through a day of historic drama a day many of her citizens had been awaiting with dread, a day some feared would shred the fabric of her society. But the feared has not come to pass. As President Ford said in his acceptance speech, our long national nightmare is over. And, you know, it, it is, every so often I take this out and I just read it, and it centers me. And it makes me feel 
I, I have had more than 40 years at CBS, including getting fired once, but not allowed out of my contract. Um, it makes me feel that I am one of the luckiest human beings on the planet. I struggled in school as a younger person. And how I ended up here at CBS in these jobs, I, when I was in the White House and we would um, cut a piece and then usually the networks would share a helicopter to catch up and I'm in these helicopters and I'm flying around the country uh, as a White House producer and I thought, how did this happen? Like, how did I get to do this? And I just, I could cry. I mean, it, it's, it's very powerful to me. We should all love our jobs. <clears throat> we should all love our jobs as much as Susan Zarinsky does. Susan, good luck at CBS News. Thank you very much. And it's an honor to have you as the first interview. Thank you. Interview.